Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Welcome to the Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. Kicking off a new series today, one that I've talked about in previous shows, interviewing all of the conservative leadership candidates as they crisscross the country, talking to them about their visions, not just for the conservative party, but also for the country. And very pleased to kick off this series by sitting down here in Toronto with Marilyn Gladue, second term member of parliament for Sarnia Lambton, and actually one who I usually run into at the London airport, uh, which is a very tiny airport, when your Sarnia airport, which is even tinier, has let you down. So it's good to see you not in the midst of traveling. So thank you very good. much for well, taking the time. Thank you for having me today. So let's talk about why you got into this race, because in many respects, a lot of people have been saying that this is just going to be a coronation. And I think as we see the policies and the interviews and the debates uh, soon, we're, we're seeing that isn't the case. This isn't lockdown. Why are you the one to take over the party? Well, originally when the, um, uh, it was clear that Andrew stepped down, I looked at what was presenting and I said, this is the same old, same old. We can't win on that. We have to get rid of Justin Trudeau. He's destroying the country and ruining the economy. And to do that, we have to grow the base. So to grow the base, I think we need several things. First thing we need is a strong, dynamic leader that can win the hearts of Canadians. And I would say that is me. Second thing we need is policy. That is a better balance of fiscal responsibility and social compassion. People love what we do as conservatives when we grow the economy, create good jobs, lower the taxes, balance the budget. But increasingly, they want more than that. They want us to help with the ailing healthcare system. They want us to come with a credible climate change plan. And they want to address um, issues that Canadians who are having difficulty uh, experience, seniors that can't afford to live, veterans that are homeless. And so we're the ones that come with solutions for these things that actually help people. But we don't want to talk about that. And I think that balance is what we need to, to see. So I've obviously had 32 years of global experience as a chemical engineer. I worked in oil and gas. I worked on emissions reduction. I can bring a credible climate change plan. Uh, as the shadow minister of health, who thought she might have been the minister of health if we had been elected this last government, I've certainly given thought to our health care system and how we can address the challenges we face with an aging demographic and increase in uh, chronic disease and uh, uh, situations like the pandemic that faces us today. And so uh, my full policy is available on www.marylandgladue.ca. And I think that's what this leadership race is about. Who can grow the party so that we can win? And uh, what kind of policy do we want to take forward? I think there's a view that a lot of people hold that social compassion is just a fancy way of saying the nanny state or the welfare state and that it's incompatible with fiscal conservatism. How do you square those two, provide that compassionate safety net while also not making everything about government owned, government run, government funded? For sure. Well, I would say, uh, uh, for example, on the seniors topic, there's a lot of poor seniors that have helped build the country but can't afford to live. Right now, they can't get the guaranteed income supplement if they make more than 19,300, when arguably the poverty line is maybe 20 27,000 depending on where you live in the country. So these kind of uh, misalignments are easily fixed and would take a huge number of seniors um, out of poverty without being a huge ticket item. If we think about pharmacare, you know, in the last election, interestingly, the 660,000 people that don't have a plan live in Ontario and Atlantic provinces where we did not do well as conservatives. Uh, for people that don't have a plan, putting them on the existing provincial plans is 2.2 billion a year. The cost of putting them on the plan is actually less than the cost of when they don't take their medications and they present that emergency or have complicated conditions. So these are the kind of areas where a, a social compassion policy uh, is actually going to help people. Uh, but as fiscal conservatives, we're going to do that in a, in a cost effective way, not the $40 billion boondoggle that the Liberals and NDP are talking about. But are, I just, just to yeah. be just to clarify, are you saying you support universal pharmacare? Uh, not at all. I think uh, people need to have a plan in Canada, for sure. Uh, we need to make sure that people can afford their medications. But uh, to create a national pharmacare system, I'm totally opposed to. First of all, provinces have stated they don't want it. Um, and the second thing is $40 billion a year is what that would cost, brought to you by the same kind people that bring you CRA. I don't think anyone wants their prescription drugs administered mm -hmm. in a similar way. 
So what would a plan look like then that deals with what you've identified as the problem that doesn't go down the road that liberals, not just federally, but even provincially, have tried to advocate? Well, I think there are multiple mechanisms to you know, address uh, the gap that exists in Ontario and the Atlantic provinces. You could just make a part of the Canada Health Act that it's, it's required for the uh, provinces to deliver pharmacare as part of their offering. That way, uh, similar to what other provinces have in place, if people don't have private plans, they would be put on the public plan. That's one solution. Now, how would that differ from where a lot of the Conservatives are, are right now very frustrated with the federal carbon tax, which is the federal government saying, we are going to demand that provinces do this? Well, I think uh, when it comes to the carbon tax, the fact remains it doesn't work. BC's had one for over 10 years and they've reduced 1%. But, but on the jurisdictional aspect, you're, you're saying that you would support the federal government making a change that essentially forces provinces to enact a specific policy. Well, I think this is something that if you look at what Canadians believe, 93% uh, of Canadians believe that people ought to ha at least have the provincial plan. And so I think it's aligning government with what needs to be done. Um, I wish that the provinces of Ontario and Atlantic would come themselves and recognize it's a cost-effective measure. But I think uh, as responsible um, federal conservatives, uh, it's our job to make sure the Canada Health Act is appropriate appropriately universal, portable, accessible across the country. And so where the provinces are not delivering, I think we have a role there. I know we, we touched briefly on, on the carbon tax, and I, I want to speak about this with you in particular, because I think more than any of the other candidates in the race, you've made a climate plan, not only a part of, of the platform that you've put out, but something that uh, you've really tried to go out of the way to, I think, talk about it and bring attention to. And, and this is an area where uh, you certainly look at the criticisms that the Liberals put towards Conservatives, that many in the media do. It, it's that they are out of alignment with where they think we need to be on the environment and on climate policy. What's your vision under a Marilyn Gladue led Conservative Party? Well, for sure, as we talked about, the carbon tax doesn't work, so we would eliminate that. But what we would do is address the top emissions in Canada. If you take a look at the list, they're really in three camps, major industrial emitters and transportation and buildings. So what I would do uh, based on my experience as a chemical engineer when I was in the refining business, there was a, an excellent mechanism put in place in the States where they gave an incentive if companies purchased and installed the technology to reduce their emissions, they got a tax offset. And if they did not, there was a regulatory regime where they paid a penalty. And it really drove people to do the right thing and to reduce their emissions, which is what we want. Um, in the uh, transportation business, that same system could be used to incentivize uh, diesel emissions from trucks. There are many wonderful technologies within Canada, nuclear, portable nuclear units that could replace diesel in the north. Uh, in terms of buildings, obviously the greening of the, the building codes is happening. But in addition to that, Japan's got some amazing incineration technology where they actually power apartment buildings on the waste from the apartment building. And that is, you know, low emissions, no odor, no sound, and it's um, such a great answer to the plastics pollution issue where we collect all of it but we only recycle 9%. So there's a lot of ideas that Canadians have and the reality is we're 1.6% of the carbon footprint of the world. We could eliminate the whole thing and it's not going to solve climate change but we have an opportunity here to lead here at home and to leverage that technology in the world to the substantive contributors and create jobs for Canadians and prosperity here. When you were in engineering, working in engineering before politics, you were actually, I've learned, very active in getting companies to lower their emissions. And I guess the question that I would raise is this is taking place pre-carbon tax, pre-Justin Trudeau. Does this not prove that the industry itself can handle this on its own and is because of market demands rather than government putting incentives in or government forcing it by regulation? Well, I think uh, companies are driven by uh, the stakeholders. And when they start to see the public sentiment in Canada valuing climate change, then they do react. And there's many companies like Suncor and Shell and, and refining businesses that are introducing great climate initiatives and emissions reduction of their own volition. Um, that's probably not enough to meet the Paris targets and to uh, take advantage of the opportunity that's before us, where we have a lot of green technology. And uh, if we look to our neighbors to the south, they just got the largest uh, emissions reduction, one gigaton, of any country over the same time period, having withdrawn from the Paris targets, but basically implementing technology to reduce emissions and getting off coal. Do you think it is important that we continue to set 
that Paris target as our benchmark? Because you haven't vowed to get out of it. You've actually vowed to meet it. Well, I think when Canada gives its word in the world, we need to follow that up with action. And so I do think we need to achieve the, the Paris targets, but I think there's an opportunity to go beyond that because really the value is if we replace the 453 coal plants that are being built with our LNG and our oil and gas products, that would cut their carbon footprint by a factor of five. So that's a significant contributor to the overall climate change issue. And I think um, it would also generate prosperity here at home. Justin Trudeau has said that famously we need to phase out the oil sands. Uh, he also said uh, in our neck of the woods in southwestern Ontario that manufacturing jobs were a, a thing of the past. Do you think that these sectors are fundamentally incompatible with a, a low carbon country, if that's what you want? I, I don't think so. And I don't think we can choose between the economy and the environment. Like I said, we could we could destroy or like eliminate our whole footprint and it wouldn't matter. So why bankrupt the country? We have to do both. And I think we have to build these nation building projects. I'm very disappointed in the tech mines decision to withdraw, but I mean, that was driven by the government's inaction since last July mm -hmm. and all of the uh, rule of law issues that Justin Trudeau didn't uh, address. And so we have to build pipelines to get our oil and gas to market so that we can capture world market prices. We have to build um, these nation building projects. That may mean that we have to do additional carbon sinks, carbon sequestration, reforestation, other initiatives that have been brought forward. We've got some great examples in my own riding where they, um, they uh, have a pepper plant that is run by the CO2 that's mm. produced by some of the local industry. So we've got some amazing ideas and we can do more. What would Prime Minister Marilyn Glad you have done to deal with the blockades? Well, uh, recognizing that I come from an area that has dealt with this in the past, I live close to Ipperwash. Mm -hmm. uh, the key is to act swiftly and to peacefully disband. Um, that didn't happen in Ipperwash. They let things go on. More and more people were added. Tensions escalated, and then it becomes a very dangerous situation. So I think Trudeau waited too long when he recognized the police were not going to step in and enforce the blockades. They should have uh, taken immediate action with the RCMP and uh, the military, if necessary, to peacefully disband the folks without anyone getting hurt. That said, I think we also have an opportunity to introduce legislation like Jason Kenney did in Alberta. They passed or they've introduced Bill 1, which allows the police to, without a warrant, remove people who are blockading public infrastructure and to charge each of them up to $25,000. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of disincentive um, that will keep crowds and activists from getting involved. I mean, there's a lot of concern that in this instance, it wasn't really about the Wet'suwet'en people. There was a lot of other uh, folks bringing their grievances and activists that, that uh, come from foreign influence that were involved. And I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things that you've done, which I, I think is very necessary in Canada, is taken aim at the foreign influence in elections. So not just in protests, but in elections. And we've seen this, I think, most notably in the 2015 election cycle, groups that receive foreign funding that uh, once they cash the check, it becomes Canadian funding and they're campaigning. And uh, really a resistance by the Liberal government who was the beneficiary of much of this in, in tackling it. So why is it that you think this needs to be dealt with? And more importantly, how could you deal with it? Sure, well, I mean, the National Security and Intelligence uh, Organization from Parliament is just releasing a report. They've identified that there are multiple ways that we have foreign interference in Canada and that Canada is actually not reacting quickly enough to those. Um, some of it is, as you've said, interference in our elections where Tides Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation are uh, able to to give millions of dollars. And that wasn't fixed in the 2019 election. They could still give six months in advance unlimited funds to um, basically keep the anti-oil agenda uh, on the table. And we also see that in the blockades, which disrupted business in our country, has cost our economy billions and inconvenienced Canadians, that there were a lot of environmental activists that are funded outside the country. So these are things that are concerning. Cybersecurity would be the other area of concern. Uh, selling 
the company that handled the anti-hacking software for the government to a Chinese uh, firm mm -hmm. was a bad idea. Uh, we, we have to make sure that we uh, step it up on cybersecurity for the government, that we enforce the rule of law, uh, and that we close the loopholes. Linda from uh, the senator has a, a Bill 239 in the last parliament that would have closed the loopholes for um, foreign interference in our elections. And it was held back by the independent senators or the independent <laughs> liberal senators, depending on how you see that. So that's something that we should reintroduce, I think, and uh, close that loophole before the next election. So you'd reintroduce that as a government bill? Absolutely. What's the real world impact on that? Because when, when you talk about a lot of these issues, I think there are many Canadians who it's enough to get them to vote, let alone to pay attention to how the sausage is made, so to speak. But, but what are for people that aren't necessarily a, as involved or connected to this issue? What's the problem? So the problem is third parties can advertise. I'm sure people have seen Lead Now, for mm -hmm. example, Unifor the teachers unions provincially. There's all kinds of third parties that are spending millions and millions of dollars hating on whichever party they don't want to see get elected. That is interference uh, for people's right to uh, you know, evaluate for themselves which party they want. Each party should be able to advertise as much as they are able to fundraise, and that should be the end of it. But when you've got huge millions of dollars being spent, and some of it coming from the states six months in advance, to these kind of organizations to drive an anti-oil agenda. That is not good for Canada. It's, uh, it's something that people may not be aware of, but the messaging is getting out. We see it on lawns, we see it in papers, even on the Tech Frontier project. We saw a huge full page ad that was taken out uh, by those that were funded foreignly. When you set out to run for office in 2015, did you have prime ministerial ambitions. Did you expect that you'd be running in the way that you are right now? Not at all. Um, in fact, I was surprised to be elected. I was uh, uh, planning to retire. Very modest. <laughs> I, was, I was planning to retire after 32 years of engineering, but I was the president of the Conservative board when the sitting member decided to retire mm -hmm. and it became my job to find the lucky one. And here I am. So having had quite a bit of success in the first parliament, obviously I, I ran again. Uh, Sarnia re-elected me with a huge majority, and, and so um, back I came expecting that, you know, Andrew Scheer would be the leader. And so now that that's not the case, we really have to find the, the solution. And I've outlined that it's a dynamic leader that can win the hearts of Canadians. I can expand the party. I think a woman as a head of the party is going to regenerate that positive tone that Ron Ambrose brought to the party. I think uh, being a youth leader, I have specific policy designed to grow our party with young. They're um, the increasingly large voting demographic, and we've got to have policy that will attract them to the party. And so having a strategy to win and having the policy to do it, that's what this leadership campaign is all about. Conservatives have traditionally driven that idea of a meritocracy home, of not choosing people based on identity. But uh, you've made a point here that there is a value of having a, a woman leader. Sure. Uh, you also don't want people to vote for you because you're a woman. So how do you square those two? Well, I think as long as you've got competency, um, you know, the rest will come. Uh, you know, people may decide they do want to vote for a competent candidate that happens also to be a woman uh, because they see the advantage in terms of attracting women to the base. But you don't support that Trudopian gender parity of cabinet, no, 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 these no. sorts of things. No, you have to choose people based on competency. I mean, obviously, Trudeau put uh, ministers in place that had no experience whatsoever in their roles, and junior ministers uh, paid the same as the finance minister and the minister of defense. If the minister of defense doesn't do his job, people die. If the finance minister doesn't do his job, we have the mess that we have now. So, uh, you know, uh, when the status of women minister doesn't do something right, what happens, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the same risk, skill, and uh, that wouldn't be the way we would be rewarded um, in private industry. You, in your platform, talk about a modern conservative party, and that word appears a number of times, or the juxtaposition of, of words. You ran under Stephen Harper. Uh, you ran under Andrew Scheer. When you talk about building a modern party, is the implication that the party in which you've served is antiquated? Um, well, first of all, let's be clear. I didn't serve under Stephen Harper. I ran, ran under, under Stephen Harper, Harper yes. but I never served under him. Um, I would say uh, when I use the word modern, it's my attempt to de delineate between the same old, same old that we've been doing and this new approach where I'll be standing up for the rights and freedoms of every Canadian because we've had a lot of negativity, a lot of um, pitting one group against another group. And at the end of the day, um, I'm going to stand up for people that are pro-life, people that are pro-choice, 
people that want to march in a pride parade, people that don't want to march in a pride parade. It's our individual freedoms. And as Canadians, if we're going to have our freedoms, we have to give other people theirs. And we've got to start treating one another respectfully and stop pitting one group against one another. And so a modern Conservative Party is that, that recognition that Canadians think the government needs to get out of this. Everyone can live how they want. So is that code for red Tory? Because that's how a lot of people are, are trying to pigeonhole this election as being about the blue Tories versus the red Tories. I don't think so. I think, you you know, within our big blue tent, we can't do without either faction. We have the social conservatives. They're 35% of our members. These people are salt of the earth. Uh, what they believe is fine. And, uh, you know, you can't have one way or the other. You would, we wouldn't be able to survive either if, if all the red Tories left the party. Uh, so there's, there's so many different kinds of conservatives. We have to stop pitting one group against one another and say, look, let's get united on the things that we care about, fiscal responsibility, social compassion. Where we differ, let's give people the freedom of conscience to vote how they want and the, the ability as duly elected MPs to bring their private members business as long as it aligns with the party policy, which the grassroots members set. So when you take that dichotomy of, of the modern versus the same old, same old, I have to ask, do you think it's a, a matter of core identity or do you think it's a matter of messaging and style? Um, I think it is a, a, a move to a better balance. I think that's where Canadians are in general. People run their ho households in a fiscally responsible way. And so, uh, you know, generally people like that. But Canadians are compassionate. And we can't just be fiscal hawks. I think in the past we've talked about the economy, the economy, the economy, and, and nothing else. And it doesn't resonate. And I think that's why we need this balance. And that's what a modern Conservative Party will do. But you've got a background in business. I, I guess the question that I'm interested in is, do you think that the issues with the Conservatives right now are about marketing or are they about the product? Uh, both. I think the communication of the party has in the past not been good. We saw that in the last election, clearly, uh, you know, the way the platform was delivered, there's so many things I could say uh, that were not ideal. I think we have to do better in terms of marketing, but you have to have something to market. You know, saying, um, you know, we don't care about people that, that you know, don't have a prescription medication plan. That, uh, I don't think that's where Canadians are. I think Canadians are more compassionate. We don't care about seniors living in poverty. I, I don't think that's, that's a view. That's the view that's led to the branding of the Conservatives today as old, traditional, cold, all these things. I think, um, you know, that's not how you grow and that's not how you win. So I think the, the, the message and the marketing of the message both have to be better. What are the issues facing Canada right now that you think no one is talking about but should be? Well, obviously the destruction of the economy in the West. Uh, people have lost their, their businesses, their houses. They're killing one another or killing themselves over this, this situation. It's dire. And so that is something that we absolutely have to address. I think um, there are a number of um, drains on our economy. The, uh, the out of control spending was not good when uh, it was sunny days. Now we've got a pandemic coming that may shut down the tourism industry that has everybody concerned that 30 to 70 percent of Canadians could get COVID-19. Um, certainly these are the serious issues of the day. The blockades will continue. We know anytime we try to do a nation building project, we'll have that issue to address. So those are the things that we have to get right. If we're going to restore business confidence, that we are a rule of law country, that we are going to create a competitive business climate where people can come and invest in these projects that will give us the jobs that we so badly need. Let's talk a, a little bit about where you'd like to see your own campaign go within the leadership race, because there is, as Western alienation grows, and you talked about it right there, I think a lot of resistance from Albertans, specifically Albertan Conservatives, Saskatchewan Conservatives, to, oh, just another person from Ontario or just another person from Quebec in particular. So how do you, as a candidate from Ontario, speak to those voices in the West and say, no, I've got your back. Well, I think clearly my 32 years as a chemical engineer, especially in oil and gas, many of the companies I worked for, Suncor, Dow, uh, Worley Parsons, were headquartered in, in mm -hmm. Edmonton or Calgary. And so um, when I go out west, I talk about those experiences and people recognize, I know how to restore prosperity in those areas. I know how to create jobs there. And I think um, you know they can appreciate that. The other thing I would say is, uh, I've worked all over the country and all over the world. And so um, I know how business works. I've worked in global business. I've worked in small business. And I think people appreciate that the balance of real world experience with parliamentary experience and success. 
that's what we need in a leader in order to be able to get things done in Parliament that are going to be the right things to let the free market create jobs. I don't even think this is going to be a question as much as a word, but immigration. Yes. Well, you know what? I, we absolutely need immigration, but I would say I would like to see us move to a different uh, proportion. I'd like to see 70% of immigrants be economic immigrants, people that come to fill skill gaps in Canada. Where we're missing doctors, nurses, uh, personal support workers, and we, can't, we don't have the capacity to even train them here locally. So that's just an example of the gaps that exist. If we could bring people here, credential them, they could be taxpayers right off the get-go, and it would really help our economy. Secondly, we have to have about 20% family reunification. Today, people are waiting three and four years to be reunited with their spouses or their children or their parents and, and paying fees while 50,000 people walk illegally into the country that yeah. we didn't choose, that we're putting up on taxpayer dollars for four years while we find out 50% of them aren't eligible to be here. So that's not how we want to do things. The, the last 10% would be those people we have compassion on people that are in war-torn and, and persecuted areas. And I prefer the privately sponsored model to the government sponsored model. We saw with the Syrian refugees that people who were privately sponsored had better outcomes. They integrated better into the communities, they got jobs, they learned the language better, and it's not a burden on the taxpayer. And so, you know, there's not necessarily a need to limit the number of those. If we have more generous people that want to privately sponsor, um, honestly, when they get working, it drives our economy. We need that growth and, and it's going to make Canada better. Do you think coming in illegally is a disqualifying factor for having that compassionate resettlement that you've mentioned? Uh, I think Canadians want to choose who is going to come to our country. And I think uh, people that are the most angry that have talked to me are people that immigrated to the country and paid their own way, were sponsored by their mm -hmm. own families, didn't get anything from the public dime, and they're angry to see people that we didn't invite here who are coming and are receiving you know, huge amounts of money and benefits uh, on the taxpayer dime. That's not fair. Uh, they've taken resources away from Immigration Canada from processing reunification for families for these folks that we didn't invite. And so I think we have to uh, work with the U.S. to close that safe third country agreement and uh, recognize they're not coming in everywhere, right? They're coming in Manitoba and Quebec because they have instant health care and instant mm -hmm. legal aid there in both of those places that they don't have any other provinces. And one of the items that jumped out to me from your platform is reinstating the language requirement for citizens mm -hmm. to speak English and French. And I don't think a lot of Canadians are aware that you don't need to speak one of the official languages yes, this to is get one, This is one of the many changes that the Liberals made. Uh, they said you don't need to speak English or French anymore to be a citizen. And that's that's a, an expense and a dangerous thing. If, if our emergency responders and first responders can only speak in English and French, um, and, and there's all these other languages that, that people are speaking and they don't speak either English or French, it's dangerous. And, and you know, it costly if we have to translate everything into everyone's language. So I think that's one of the changes that we should reverse. Now, when it comes to family reunification, uh, grandma coming from Italy or some other country is unlikely to be able to learn English in her old age. Someone who comes in under compassionate grounds may not have had the opportunity to learn English in schooling if they've come from a, a war-torn region. So you're not putting that language restriction in for immigration itself, but just for citizenship? Well, for citizenship, and I would say there was an exemption in the old citizenship for people who are older because it was mm -hmm. recognized that at 65 you weren't going to you know, learn a new language. So. Mm -hmm. I think that exemption was fine, it worked for years, and, and it should be reinstated with the requirement for English and French. Let's talk about how you would view going into the next election, whenever it is, and going up against Justin Trudeau, what do you think is his biggest weakness? And, and I, I realize that's a loaded question, but at the same time, for all of the Conservatives that just thought, there's no way this guy could win again, he did, he's there again. So clearly something about what he's doing is resonating with Canadians. What's your priority in, in serving as, opposi as opposition leader in Parliament, but going up against him in an election as well? Well, I think, you know, people know who Justin Trudeau is. The branding exercise on the Liberals said the three words they would use to describe them were liar, untrustworthy, and corruption. 
So they were looking for an alternative. We got an increase in the popular vote. We did get more seats. People were really looking for that leader and that platform that would draw them to the party. And I think those are the two things that I will deliver. Um, that said, if you look at uh, Trudeau's ethical violations and you compare that to somebody who's a professional engineer, has always had to have a code of conduct and ethics and integrity or we lose our license. Um, my record is clean. There is no skeleton to dig up in my past. And I think um, that along with a plan the Liberals never have a plan. Even yesterday, they uh, announced a billion dollars for the pandemic, and what are they going to do with it? Well, we're not really sure. Well, that's not a plan. And so I have a plan, and a plan to restore Canada to prosperity, to safety, and I would say happiness. What is your first bill or first motion as leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I think the, the first one would have to be um, a similar bill to what Jason Kenney has put in place to establish the rule of law, because we can't restore the prosperity in the West and start building these projects if we have anarchy. I find, I, I'm not laughing at your idea. I'm laughing at the idea that we're in this country now where establishing rule of law has to exist and it's not just a standard and a constant. I mean, that's where we've well, come. Well, how sad is that? Yeah. that? That even when you looked at the polling, you saw 40% of people were okay with folks that were illegally protesting. I was alarmed when mm -hmm. I saw that. That's a real erosion of the principle of the rule of law, which is what keeps society civil. And so we definitely have to you know, reinforce that. And we see from the foreign investment leaving that they also see that shift, that it's not sure that the government is actually going to keep things stable here. So when you look through your roadmap for the next few months as we head from now to the leadership, is there a faction of the party that you're trying to go after? Or are you trying to say, listen, I'm the one that social conservatives should vote for. I'm the one that Alberta uh, oil sector workers should vote for. I'm the one that, you know, GTA suburban families should vote for. Is that really the goal? Uh, for myself, uh, my challenge is that I'm the least known. But I would say those that are well known are not necessarily the best loved. The more people get to know me, the more they love my message, the more they love me. And so my challenge is to get the message out there through social media, through traveling around the country, uh, folks like yourself in the media that can help and to um, achieve the milestones. So by March 25th, to make sure that I'm on the ballot. Once I'm on the ballot, then the strategy is uh, to go where I'm going to be strong. I worked in Quebec for 15 years and my French is very good. And so depending on who's on the ballot, my French might be the best. And that would be an advantage in Quebec, having worked there and understanding the people of Quebec. Um, I have roots in, in the East Coast as well. Uh, I know that Peter McKay is strong there, but when I went down to the Halifax Convention and people heard me, Many that were going to vote him first ballot changed their minds. And so uh, we've talked about the West and I'll be popular in the West, popular in Ontario, popular, uh, I would say, in B.C. And I just came back from Iqaluit. So I'm certainly covering the whole country. Yeah, you've gone from uh, coast to coast to coast and in between. Indeed. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. Marilyn Gladue, Sarnia Lambton, Member of Parliament, Engineer and Candidate for the Leadership of the Conservatives. Marilyn, thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. All right, this is the beginning of our series on leadership candidates here on True North, but by no means the end. We'll have interviews with hopefully all of the candidates in the weeks to come. My thanks to all of you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you, God bless, and good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.